Well, thank you very much for being here this evening. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity to address such an important issue. Uh, let me just explain at the beginning uh, where the topic came from. We had originally planned the debate with Christopher Hitchens, and I came up with the topic because of the fact that uh, Mr. Hitchens' own book, God is Not Great, in the section on the New Testament, used the terminology of evil in describing the New Testament, the evil of the New Testament. So if you've listened to any of Mr. Hitchens' debates, you know that they pretty much flow along the same lines. And so we wanted to get into some of the biblical material, some of the claims that he made against the New Testament and against uh, its unity and its teaching, and that's where the topic came from. As we all know, uh, Christopher Hitchens is currently undergoing chemotherapy for esophageal cancer. And uh, even he has mentioned in most of the interviews that I've seen uh, that many of us have indicated to him that we are praying for his recovery because obviously our desire uh, is uh, not that I get a chance to debate him in the future, uh, but that he come to know the truth of who his creator is uh, before he faces him in judgment. And so we continue to pray toward that end. And so that's where the topic comes from this evening. Now, it is, uh, I was making notes that it is ironic to me uh, that while most of the time when I engage opponents of the Christian faith, whether it be Bart Ehrman uh, or uh, John Dominic Crossan or Marcus Borg or whoever else it might be, the argumentation they present is that the New Testament is completely disjointed, uh, that it is self-contradictory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the argument this evening has been just the opposite, uh, that it is a maniacal document that purposefully is designed uh, to create this church where you have to do what your pastor says. Now, it sounds a little bit like medieval Roman Catholicism, but as most of you know, I'm not a Roman Catholic. Uh, and in fact, I just debated a Roman Catholic apologist on Saturday evening on the subject of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, I am a Reformed Baptist, and uh, we are part of the free church tradition. And most of what was said in regards to the idea of making money and all the rest of that stuff was, of course, utterly irrelevant to me and utterly relevant to the vast majority of Christians. It's a straw man, and I think most of you can recognize that and dismiss that. But we, I am very thankful uh, for the direction that Mr. Silverman has gone this evening, because we have an opportunity, I think, to truly understand the fundamental differences between a naturalistic materialist, as my opponent is this evening, and a Christian in regards to the subject of one's worldview, and the centrality of one's worldview in the interpretation of the text of the New Testament. I would first like to challenge uh, Mr. Silverman to reflect upon the absurdity of a naturalistic materialist as he is, a pure secularist, to even have walked into the room this evening to debate the subject. He has absolutely positively no foundation upon which to define something as evil. How can anyone who believes that we are merely the random result of billions of years of undirected, random mutation, how can anyone who believes that there is no transcendent value to human life whatsoever, that we might be here, we might not be here, it doesn't really matter, and that mankind itself is not the result of a process that was aiming for him, we're just the accident at the end of an undirected series of micromutations. How can anyone who really believes that call anything evil? Fundamentally, if you're a neo-Darwinian, micromutational evolutionary theorist, you believe that that which is good is that which passes the majority of your genotype on to the largest portion of the next generation. That's it. And if that means going around and raping and pillaging and destroying your enemies or whatever else it might be, then that would have to be good from that perspective. But upon what basis does my opponent this evening raise and pull at our heartstrings about little babies? Little babies are nothing but protoplasm in his worldview. The fact of the matter is, folks, no matter how hard he tries, since Mr. Silverman is in fact created in the Imago Dei, in the image of God, he will not be able to stand before you this evening and argue any of these points without stealing from my worldview to do it. He is going to utilize all sorts of statements that make sense only in the theistic worldview to then turn around and bite the hand that feeds him. And we've already seen it in the presentation that has been made. But the question is, upon what basis 
Would a naturalistic materialist walk into this room and say the New Testament is evil? Well, we just heard. I don't like what it says. Now, I'm not granting for even a moment that what Mr. Silverman has said is an accurate representation of the New Testament in many ways. It ignores much of what it says. I'll get into that in the rebuttal period because that's what I'm supposed to do at that point in time. But the reality is, is what we've heard is, well, it's evil because I can contort it in such a way that it flows against a presentation that I can make that will sort of hopefully bring a lot of you along. I can allege that you're all in this just for the money. You're all in this just for fear. I can present a perspective of the gospel that ignores the vast majority of its own statements. And as a result, I can call that evil. But again, from his worldview, how is any of that evil? From a naturalistic, materialistic perspective, how is any of that evil? I mean, I could make an argument from an evolutionary perspective that if that allows me to have more children and pass my genotype on to the next generation, which is the greatest good in a naturalistic, materialistic world, then that makes it good. See, we need to look at the foundations upon which we stand. And I say to you this evening that the whole reason that we've gathered here this evening, the whole reason any of you came here, atheists or Christians, is because you believe that we can actually logically reason with one another. We can communicate with one another. And the communication that we have with one another can actually make sense. And we can determine whether something is true or something is false. And I suggest to you that my opponent this evening cannot explain why, on his worldview, we can do what we're doing this evening. How do you explain the laws of logic? Or do you just simply say it's a brute fact? Well, it's just the way it is. It might have evolved differently. We might have come up with a different way. Maybe, you know, the law of non-contradiction. You know, we, we can't say that, uh, that uh, this, uh, this table is in this room and not in this room the same way at the same time. It, you know, things might have been different. There might have been different rules in the universe that would have allowed that to be true. Just a brute fact. I can tell you why that's true. I can reason with you. Because I have a worldview and a God that is sufficient as the creator who made me a communicating being. And the reason that logic works in my brain and it works in your brain too is not just because of some agreement we've all come to. It's because of the way that we ourselves have been created. And so first I will challenge Mr. Silverman to explain, why do you call any of this evil? You may not like it, but you're not our final authority, just like I'm not the final authority. Was it true before you were born? Was it, fought? Was it evil before you were born? Will it be evil after you're gone? That's the question. In fact, will anything be true or false, evil or good, beautiful or ugly, five minutes after Mr. Silverman's heart stops beating or mine stops beating? From a naturalistic perspective, how can he even answer that question? He won't exist anymore. Transcendent meaning transcendent reality. We have to start there to even ask the question. And once we do, what we've seen this evening is that the natural man hates the things of the Spirit of God. He who is in rebellion against God hates the message that he is in rebellion against God. Uh, many, many years ago, I stood outside of the National Convention of the American Atheists in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I held a sign up along with some friends of mine. And my sign said, Atheists! Creatures denying their creator. Now, I had been out of high school for a little while at that point. I think I was in seminary at that time. And I heard words from folks going by me that I hadn't heard since the locker room at high school. And I'm not going to repeat any of them because I respect you. But you know what? There were people there that did not like what I had to say in any way, shape, or form because the natural man does not like to hear what the gospel says. In fact, I was reminded, listening to Mr. Silverman, to the words of the Apostle Paul. He said, the word of the cross, the message of the cross, is foolishness. It's foolishness. Moria, from what, what, the same, same root word we get moron from. It's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. How can two intelligent people 
educated people look at the same text and come to such completely different conclusions. Because when I look at the New Testament, I see the fulfillment of God's covenant promises that he made generations before. I see the fulfillment of prophecy. I see an incredible message that God in his mercy and his grace has actually condescended to enter into his own creation so as to provide the only means of salvation, not for a bunch of innocent people, but for people who hate him. They love their rebellion. They're not people who are splashing about in an ocean looking for someone to rescue them. When the rescue boat pulls up next to them, they spit at the person and dive. We're talking about haters of God. And yet, that's where all of us were at one point. All of us had hearts of stone until we were given a heart of flesh by the miracle of regeneration. And it is those rebels that God in his love the second person of the Trinity enters into human existence, human experience, takes on the form of a man, lives amongst us, and becomes obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So that every person who is in him, every person who has saving faith in him, every person united to him can have what only he can give, that is forgiveness of sins and eternal life. When I see the New Testament, I see the testimony of the triune God, the fulfillment of the promises of the Father, the coming of the Son, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and God accomplishing His purposes. Yes, we are given moral direction. And yes, we are told. We are told about God's judgment because that's what lies behind the cross. If you do not see in the cross the wrath of God against sin, then you don't understand the holiness of God. If all you see in the cross is the love of God, then you're not seeing the whole picture of the cross. Because behind the cross lies God's absolute holiness. And hence the condescension that is his in the cross of Jesus Christ and the expression of that love in redeeming undeserving rebels is truly seen only when we see the seriousness of what the Bible says about God's holiness. Now, those who rebel against that holiness don't want to hear about that fact of sin. And they are going to say, well, you're just trying to make people fearful. Most criminals who know they're guilty are fearful of a judge. Most criminals who know they're guilty, who are suppressing the truth of their own guilt, aren't really looking forward to standing before that judge who will hear the facts of the case and judge rightly. Romans chapter 1 tells us very clearly that men know that God exists. I believe that Mr. Silverman knows that God exists. Now, I don't know. I've listened to a number of his presentations, and he's very confused about what Christians believe and, and very confused about the history of Christianity, thinks that it's none of it's unique. We got all from Osiris and things like that. I would love to debate that, by the way. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's been debunked for a long, long time, but only the Internet drags that kind of stuff back up. But one thing that is very, very clear is that the Scriptures tell us that everyone sitting in this room knows that God exists. And either you, by God's grace, embrace that and worship him, or you are in some way suppressing, the Greek term is katakonton, an active participle, holding down that knowledge of God. Now, you can do that religiously. There are many people who suppress that knowledge of God religiously through false religion, even people who call themselves Christians. Or in the open way of an atheist. Suppressing that knowledge, denying that God that you know exists is there. And since that's the case, 
then the scriptures say that you are unapologetus, without an apologetic, without a defense. The truth, if you will but hear it, the truth, if you will but stop yelling long enough to hear it and to consider it, will expose the fact that you are holding down that knowledge. And in that act of holding down that knowledge, mankind twists the truth of God. He twists the conscience that is within him. Now, fundamental to all of this is a recognition that God, as our creator, has the right to determine what is right and what is wrong. In fact, I submit to you that when a society loses a firm grip on the reality that we are created beings, when a society devolves to the point where it embraces the idea that we have no transcendent meaning, that there is no moral absolute that we can appeal to, that society is in its death throes. The results are what we see around us today. The Holocaust and murder of unborn children. The push to begin allowing us to get rid of the elderly because, well, you know, there's such a drain on society, you know. The culture of death we see around us makes sense if we are but bags of protoplasm who are not created, who have no purpose and no direction from God. If that were the case, then we would have a very different debate this evening, but the fact of the matter is that God has revealed to us in his word that he is holy And we know that we have violated his law. As such, we know that we cannot stand in his presence. We heard it said earlier, well, you can be convicted for thought crime, my friends. Rebellious and sinful thoughts flow from a rebellious and sinful heart. As Lord Jesus himself said, as a man speaks, that represents what is in his heart. And the doctrine of original sin is not a heinous evil any more than when you go to the doctor and he brings you in. He says, we did the x-rays, we did the tests. You have cancer. You may not like that. That may change your world. You don't want to hear those words, but if it's, it, is, it is a true analysis of your situation. Those words are not evil. That man's doing the best thing that can be done for you telling you the truth. And so you see, to the heart that has yet to be reined in in its rebellion, the announcement of one's conviction before God, that's evil. How dare you say something like that? The fact of the matter is, what the Scriptures say is true. God is holy, and God in His mercy and in his love, is glorifying himself through the salvation of a particular people in and through Jesus Christ, and only in and through Jesus Christ, because he doesn't owe us multiple ways of salvation. I will address the issue of God's sovereignty, of God's decree in my rebuttal period. But let me just simply say for the moment, the message of the New Testament will only be evil to those who have yet to come to know its author. I fully understand why a person who hates this God and hates this gospel and continues to suppress the knowledge of God would hate what this New Testament says. I understand that. But you see, as the text in 1 Corinthians 1 tells us, The word of the cross, which is the central message of the New Testament. That is its unifying core. The word of the cross is foolishness to a particular people, to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the very power of God. The same message, heard and received completely differently, By different people. How can that be? I suggest to you 
that in eternity to come, in eternity to come, when there are those who stand upon the parapets of hell, screaming their hatred of God and their continued rebellion. Sin doesn't stop, by the way, for them. It's not like they become morally good and therefore they should be let out after a certain time on parole. The difference between those who stand upon the parapet of hell, screaming out their rebellion against God, and those, by God's grace, who bow before the throne in humble adoration, filled with love for their creator, is a five-letter word called grace. I am no better than anyone who this evening continues in their rebellion. The fact of the matter is, at a young time in my life, God was gracious to me. He reached down. He took out that heart of stone. He gave me a heart of flesh. And once I have that heart of flesh, I wanted to do what was right before my creator. And I continue to desire to do that to this evening only by his grace. My prayer is that God will glorify himself this evening in drawing many others, in changing hearts, in changing minds by his grace through his word. Thank you for being here this evening. Okay.